Uh, well, welcome everyone. Um, so today uh, we are um, blessed by the presence of Ye Chong Lu, who is professor and chair of um, the Department of Diplomacy at Zhengzhou University in Taiwan. Um, so Professor Lu is, was previously vice president to the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, which is a leading think tank in Taiwan, uh, is engaged in research to do with democratization and, and policymaking. Um, so Dr. Liu is, uh, has published in a variety of outlets to do with US-China relations, cross-strait relations, and foreign policy more generally. Um, and so today he'll be talking about uh, East Asian politics under the Biden administration. So welcome, Professor Liu. We're delighted to have you here today. Um, and the floor is yours. OK, uh, thank you, uh, especially uh, for uh, Dr. Dai and also uh, our host, uh, Dr. McNee, to uh, host and organize this wonderful event. It's really my honor to join all of you uh, this afternoon. Uh, especially, uh, I think I would like to thank the UCLA Asia Pacific Center uh, for putting everything together. And uh, I apologize for uh, being a bit late uh, due to some technical issues. Uh, for my presentation today, uh, I was informed that maybe I can have about uh, 35 to 40 minutes uh, to do the presentation. And I think the most fruitful part would be uh, the exchange of our views uh, after uh, my, my speech. Uh, so, first of all, um, I would like to present the outline of my presentation today. Uh, there will be like four parts uh, in my presentation today. Uh, I would like to highlight especially uh, the U.S.-China competition nowadays uh, because I think that is a uh, determinant uh, factor uh, that has tremendous impact on the current uh, situation in the Asia-Pacific. And then I will move on to talk about the cross trade relations nowadays, and then I will touch upon uh, maybe to a limited extent uh, on what is going to happen in the following few months uh, with regard to the uh, politics in uh, East Asia. Uh, so, first of all, uh, let me uh, explain a bit about my observation on the nature of U.S.-China competition uh, nowadays. Uh, we all know that uh, the current competition between China and the United States is serious, uh, as President Biden uh, mentioned for many, many times. Uh, there were some uh, factors behind all this. Uh, we all know that international structure, uh, which means the distribution of national capabilities, uh, that uh, has a tremendous uh, impact on how states uh, interact with one another. Uh, other than that, uh, I think uh, it is quite important we also pay attention to the state level and domestic politics, uh, especially on the China side. Uh, we noticed just a couple weeks ago uh, Xi Jinping actually cons further consolidated his political power within the CCP. Um, it has some, a lot of implications uh, for the region. Uh, some people are still uh, questioning whether he is going to have his uh, third term. But I think after this sixth uh, plenum uh, of the 19th Party Congress, um, it, clear, it clears out all the doubts whether he is going to take his third term. Uh, more people right now are more curious about how and what he is going to do in his third term. And also, uh, I think perceptions of the leaders also play a very important uh, role uh, in explaining US-China competition. We know that Xi Jinping is more like a strong man uh, in Chinese history. Not only this, uh, I think he played a very um, significant role in shaping uh, the current regional order in the Asia Pacific and the Indo Pacific, of course. Also, I think President Biden uh, and his predecessor, uh, President Trump, um, both gentlemen have their uh, different interpretation about uh, the leadership of the United States and also the, the relationship across the Pacific between China and the United States. Uh, for now, I'm so glad to see that uh, on the U.S. side, especially under President Biden, 
uh, it seems to be very uh, the administration uh, itself seems to be very uh, pragmatic, um, not working against China just for uh, domestic political consumption or uh, the aggregation of um, personal uh, political capital. So I think this is a, a very positive development across the Pacific. However, we know that uh, the competition between the two big countries, um, it is very, very serious, as I just mentioned, uh, in many, many ways. And in the months to come, uh, I will get to that later. Uh, we hope to see something uh, different. Uh, but I think if China uh, continue its path uh, to become a rising power, challenging the current international order, then that will be a serious problem. So I highlight here, uh, the Chinese uh, continue to say the overall situation uh, in international affairs should be a win-win situation rather than a zero-sum situation. However, my understanding is uh, what China under Xi Jinping is doing is more leaning to uh, the zero-sum thinking rather than the win-win thinking. Or if the Xi Jinping leadership is talking about win-win, it's more like China wins more, you win little, something like that. So maybe my interpretation uh, is, is wrong, but I think in reality, we can find evidence uh, supporting this kind of analysis. Other than that, one thing is also very, very important. Uh, the United States continue to say it is upholding a rule-based international order. However, on the Chinese side, they continue to emphasize the international order based on international laws. In other words, um, it is not a, uh, to China, it is not a shared uh, knowledge that everyone should follow rule-based. Rather, everyone should follow international laws. So. Some people are uh, contending that uh, right now there seems to be a cold war between China and the United States. So I, I highlighted uh, some uh, basic natures, uh, which is changing over time. China right now is economically wealthy, still ruled by an authoritarian regime with stronghold on society. And more importantly, China is not shy from flexing muscles to neighbors and pursuing predominance in, in the region. And there seems to be an emerging ideological war between uh, China and the rest of the world. However, having said that, uh, there are two things uh, worth noting. One is about China's ambition. Uh, the Chinese government continue to say they, has no, they have no intention to replace the United States uh, in world affairs. Uh, also, the rest of the world is still wondering whether China under Xi Jinping or in Xi's dynasty can maintain uh, stability and economic prosperity. So I think for those two issues, uh, we still need to wait to see. However, on the diplomatic front, we can see that China under Xi Jinping continues to stress importance of the democratization in international relations. Uh, so this is quite different from uh, what we have known about the rule-based international order. What is more importantly is China continues to emphasize the importance of multilateralism. However, this kind of multilateralism uh, is carried out uh, with Chinese character characteristics including exchange of interests, uh, but not uh, exchange the wide ex accepted norms in international affairs. Also, uh, China is trying to sell um, its thinking about the co community of common destiny for all mankind. Uh, but I would say this conception remains very vague, uh, even um, in the United Nations. Not so many countries are fully aware of what it is. But in the meantime, uh, we can see that right now China occupies four out of 15 specialized agencies of the United Nations. Uh, more in-depth discussion on this issue uh, have already been published by many experts and scholars. Uh, they tend to conclude that over time, 
maybe through this kind of uh, uh, occupation on important uh, posts in international organizations, it will be more likely for China to expand its influence worldwide. Okay, uh, after talking about the structural um, background about the US-China competition nowadays, uh, let me turn to the cross-strait relations. Uh, it is also a uh, very important question in debate nowadays that people begin to talk about whether the United States is abandoning its strategic ambiguity uh, in the cross-strait relations uh, is related issues. For the idea of strategic ambiguity, uh, we can date uh, the idea all the way back to the 1950s, uh, especially prior to the first Taiwan Strait crisis, which happened between uh, the September 1954 to April 1955. Uh, back then, the U.S. expressed that the U.S. does not state clearly whether it will come to Taiwan's defense in the event of any attack by PRC. The definition came from a very um, re a renowned scholar, Nancy Tucker. In her book, he stated that over time in the past over um, 15 years, uh, the United States continued to work on this strategic uh, ambiguity, uh, trying to cool both sides across Taiwan straight down and uh, trying to maintain peace and stability across uh, Taiwan Strait. And the main idea behind this thinking is it is a kind of deterrence by uncertainty, which means both sides across the Taiwan Strait, without uh, fully aware of what the United States is going to react. So on the Chinese side, maybe China would find it might be very risky if any invasion of Taiwan is going to happen. And for the Taiwan side, uh, which means they don't know if the Taiwan independence uh, movement uh, start any kind of fire across the Taiwan Strait, the United States would come to rescue or not. So they may have to think twice uh, before taking actions. So we can see that there are some benefits of this strategic ambiguity. The first one is uh, the conception and the myths, the dis disagreement uh, without breaking up especially between uh, Taiwan, China, and also between China and the United States. This can also help avoid head-on confrontation or showdown, especially for U.S. Re managing its relationship with PRC. Third, it helps to preserve privileged positions, uh, especially on the U.S. side. The U.S. can continue to play as a offshore balancer on this cross strait relations, a trustful third party to both sides. So this is in U.S. interest. Uncertain and deniable in nature, that is also another thing about this strategic ambiguity. So uh, without any possibility for entrapment uh, for the U.S. to be engaged with China militarily, I think this conception serves U.S. interest the best. In the meantime, some discussions also highlight there are already some problems of this strategic ambiguity. For one, it is not morally defensible, especially uh, to Taiwan. We all know that there are a lot of grassroots um, groups uh, in the states uh, supporting Taiwan uh, very much. Uh, they continue to say the United States should uh, be on the Taiwan side because Taiwan is relatively weak and small. However, this strategic ambiguity can prevent the United States from taking more uh, actions in helping Taiwan. So they say that Taiwan is a democracy. Uh, the U.S. is the leader of the de demo democratic world. So U.S. should do more to help Taiwan. This creates certain kind of uh, moral uh, issues for the United States. Also, secondly, this idea might be misleading to Taiwan or face under interpretation 
on the China side. So even we have talked about this can prevent Taiwan from uh, taking productive actions to declare in the jury independence, uh, can prevent China from taking risky as military actions against Taiwan. However, in the meantime, if both sides uh, just misinterpret uh, the idea uh, and the intention of the United States, there will be some uh, misperception in this regard, then the outcome, the result can be very problematic. Third, the idea itself may lead to mistrust and worsen the relationship. Especially nowadays, we can see that China's growing suspicion of the United States. And also, um, one other uh, very fundamental issue is we all know that in the past uh, more than 60 decades, uh, Taiwan and China throughout the history, uh, we have serious confrontation, uh, but we also have economic engagement and interactions. So over time, uh, especially on the Chinese side, they continue to say uh, it is in the foreseeable future, uh, Taiwan uh, would unify uh, with China because people to people exchanges is growing, economic interactions is very positive and gro also growing. So uh, this can not prevent Taiwan from being drawn into China's orbit, especially under coercion as we see nowadays. So some people are saying there are a lot of problems of strategic ambiguity, and even arguing that the conception of strategic ambiguity has already uh, been outdated. Uh, but what this conception really is, uh, we have talked about that. And in history, uh, what kind of uh, uh, evidence we have uh, arguing that this conception is helpful in managing um, the cross trade relations, especially from the U.S. side. Uh, I went back to um, the uh, crisis across the Taiwan Strait throughout history, and I found that uh, it is quite uh, important for the U.S. to uphold uh, this concept. For example, in the second Taiwan Strait crisis, uh, which lasts uh, for only two months, okay, for only two months, but the impact of this, because um, China decided uh, at last to have uh, the bombardment on uh, Jingmen on alternate days, it lasts until uh, the end of 1970s, so it is quite long. Back into this second Taiwan Strait crisis, back then, especially after the first uh, Taiwan crisis, the U.S. understand it is quite important uh, to make it clear that the um, United States is on the Taiwan side in the event of PRC's attack. So both sides, the U.S. and the Republic of China, uh, the Taiwan side, they signed this mutual defense treaty in the December of 1954. In the December of 1954. And during this second Taiwan Strait crisis, Dallas, back then, uh, the Secretary of State, he released a statement which maintained that the U United States is bound by treaty to help defend Taiwan or Formosa from armed attack and the president is authorized to employ the armed forces of the United States for the securing and protecting of related positions, such as Kimoi and Matsu. This is quite important, and this is a strategic clarity, not ambiguity, that helped deter uh, PRC during that period of time. So, as we can see, in the second Taiwan Strait crisis, one is there is a mutual defense treaty between the United States and Taiwan. Secondly, the U.S. continue to express its intention to help Taiwan and to help defend Taiwan. This is quite important. However, as I just mentioned, 
it is not only uh, China continue to do this bombardment on alternate uh, days, but also after this crisis, the Chinese decide, decided to develop its nuclear weaponry system. So we can see that strategic clarity can serve uh, the U.S. interest and Taiwan's interest in this kind of event. However, there will be some consequences after exerting uh, this kind of clarity. The third Taiwan crisis is also uh, worth noting uh, because uh, it happened in the March uh, of 1996. During that period of time, we all know that uh, Taiwan's pre former president Li Denghui uh, paid a visit to his alma mater, uh, Cornell University. It is a uh, welcome uh, message from the U.S. Congress indicating U.S. support for Taiwan. However, it totally antagonized the Chinese side because it is not only about China's face, but also uh, because right before uh, the U.S. Congress uh, passed the resolution to invite President Li for the visit, just before this passage uh, of the resolution, the Chinese government was informed by the U.S. side saying that the administration is not going to grant this kind of visa to President Li. However, with strong support from the Congress, uh, the administration finally uh, granted the visa uh, to President Li and made his trip possible. So the Chinese side, uh, they are not only losing face, they are also losing their trust in the U.S. government back then. So they reacted very, very strongly. They conducted several rounds of military exercise surrounding Taiwan. And in March that year, Taiwan is going to have uh, Taiwan was having uh, its very first uh, direct uh, presidential election. So on the Chinese side, this is not only uh, a U.S. support for Taiwan, uh, supporting Li Denghui to be uh, the next president of Taiwan, but also uh, this election gave high legitimacy to the Taiwanese government because it indicates the, the Li Denghui government after 1996 enjoy the full mandate from the people of Taiwan. So this is a deviation from the Chinese uh, long-time position that Taiwan is part of China. So this creates um, more problems to the Chinese leadership. So during that period of time, especially in March, 1996, before uh, Taiwanese people cast uh, their votes for the election, the United States sent out two uh, warship, uh, including Nimitz and Independence, uh, the uh, uh, carrier groups uh, to the surrounding area uh, of Taiwan to indicate the U.S. intention in preserving peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. This is quite important. However, uh, as we know, uh, because during this period of time, the Mutual Defense Treaty already uh, been revoked. The treaty itself was revoked um, in 1979, before, uh, during the time that the United States decided to establish its diplomatic relationship with PRC. So the Clinton administration sent out these two uh, battleship groups under the idea of strategic ambiguity, not strategic clarity. However, what we have learned uh, from this crisis is, it seems to be um, a asymmetric situation between China and the United States, in the sense that China sees Taiwan as a core interest, uh, but still, uh, until today, uh, we are not sure how much weight uh, Taiwan is carrying 
in uh, U.S. national interest. Having said that, we all know uh, the U.S. different uh, administrations continue to stress the importance of Taiwan and especially uh, in economic terms. Uh, but politically and uh, on security uh, terms, it remains unclear uh, whether especially uh, to Taiwanese people. We are not sure whether Taiwan uh, play a as a core interest uh, to the United States. Okay, over time, uh, we can see that it is the idea of strategic ambiguity is in the interest of the United States. And it is also in the interest of US that both sides across the Taiwan Strait would demonstrate self restraint because US remain unclear on its attitude of involvement if conflict ever occurred. If we went through um, the one China policy, uh, which is also a revelation of this strategic ambiguity or the debate uh, whether US should change its ambiguity to clarity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. But US one China policy is actually a means to an end. Uh, what is the what are the content contents in this US one China policy? Of course, it includes three communiques between the United States and the PRC and also the Taiwan Relations Act and also the six assurances. The essence of this one China policy is the peaceful resolution. It is quite important uh, for both sides across the Taiwan Strait uh, to sort out this dispute uh, by peaceful means. This is what the United States continue to express. Also, under this idea of strategic ambiguity, the United States, by not giving either Taiwan or China a clear commitment, the U.S. can discourage both sides from taking unilateral actions to change the status quo. And what status quo means, that is a big question. And I believe uh, our participants would have uh, something to say about this status quo. But uh, from the U.S. perspective, it is mainland China and Taiwan are separately governed by two political entities across the Taiwan Strait. Here still begs the question, China continue to say the United States is deviating from its one China uh, idea. Uh, we will get to that later. And also, from the Chinese perspective, the U.S. arms sales to ta Taiwan seems to be very, very, very problematic. Especially over time, it helped the Taiwanese people to grow uh, their own confidence vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, China's proposal to unification. But I would say uh, for the One China policy, in the past 30 years, uh, there, it actually serves some functions. For one, it acknowledges the legitimacy of PRC, which gave uh, the legitimacy for the United States to engage uh, with China. Arms sales to Taiwan, this is quite important to boost Taiwanese people's confidence while uh, interacting uh, across the Taiwan Strait with China. However, one thing is very, very important. Taiwan's future status. Uh, for this one, the U.S. Uh, remains an unclear position on the status of Taiwan. Uh, but this is very, very uh, important for Taiwan, for the United States. But also, this creates, from time to time, some kind of um, differences uh, between the United States and China. One thing is very, very important. Uh, under the Clinton administration, as I just mentioned, Taiwan has its very first uh, national presidential election, uh, especially by 
uh, the general voting of the all public qualified citizen living in Taiwan. So democratization becomes over time a very serious and important element to U.S. one China policy. So after 1906, under the Clinton administration, the administration continued to emphasize the importance of peaceful resolution with the ascent of the people of Taiwan. This is quite important. To Bush Jr., uh, 43, uh, the president himself once said, the U.S. would do whatever it took to help Taiwan defend itself. While engaging uh, with Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao, president also says that there shouldn't be any unilateral change across the Taiwan Strait. And also he mentioned peaceful resolution uh, with the ascent uh, of pe the people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Okay. So this is a little bit different. Under Obama, Obama continued this one China policy with strategic ambiguity. Uh, three things uh, continue to appear uh, in Obama's statement regarding uh, the cross-strait relations. One is, of course, peaceful resolution of disputes. Second, the opposition to unilateral actions taken by either side. And third, uh, the U.S. expressed its enc encouragement to dialogues. So these three things seem to complement one another in achieving U.S. abiding interests across the Taiwan Strait. So this remains very, very important. Under President Trump, however, uh, things begin to uh, become very, very interesting. Whether and how the U.S. would respond depending, uh, uh, depending on the circumstances seem to be a clear encouragement for preemption with regard to the cross-trade relations especially when China is enjoying a huge gap vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan in economic and military terms. So from the very beginning, uh, because President Trump, on the Chinese side, they, their interpretation of President Trump is he is more a transactional uh, leader in nature. So China, um, for a very short period of time, uh, has become very assertive and provocative in cross-strait relations. However, in the meantime, we still see that the six, six assurances uh, appeared in the Republican, the party's platform uh, during the campaign. Uh, this is a, 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 a reassuring message to Taiwan, along with when President Trump was the, pres the president-elect, he had a phone call uh, with President Tsai of Taiwan. Uh, in that phone call, uh, we all know that um, it is not only the courtesy call, it is also very, very politically symbolic uh, to both sides across the Taiwan Strait. So China uh, reacted to that phone call uh, seriously. However, uh, after two months, President Trump also made a phone call uh, with President Xi recommitted the U.S. one China policy under which the U.S. maintains only unofficial relations with Taiwan while also upholding the TRA, the Taiwan Relations Act. And in his National Security Strategy report, uh, the report itself says that the U.S. will maintain our strong ties with Taiwan in accordance with our one China policy, including our commitments under the TRA to provide Taiwan uh, to provide for Taiwan's legitimate defense needs and deter coercion. What is more important is um, we all notice that under President Trump, especially uh, after 2016, uh, because President Tsai belongs to DPP, uh, it is deemed as a um, pro-Taiwan independence party by the Chinese side. So China uh, began to take uh, very aggressive actions across the Taiwan Strait. I will show uh, about the POA air, air fighters 
um, getting cr close to Taiwan's ADIZ later. Okay, also under President Trump, uh, we can see there seems to be an opportunity for Taiwan uh, to continue to pursue closer ties with the United States. One thing is very, very important. There seems to be a bipartisan consensus in U.S. Congress that U.S. should take actions against China's predatory economic practices and military and political interference around the world. So it is for the first time after the end of Cold War that Congress and the administration are on the same page against China. So I just highlighted uh, this act passed by the Congress. Uh, the very last two, uh, they were just introduced uh, to uh, the Senate and also to the Congress uh, respectively. But uh, President Trump did sign this Taiwan Travel Act into the public law in March 2018 which allows uh, the U.S., uh, sorry, the high-level officials on the Taiwan side to pay visits to the United States. And also the second one, the Taipei Act, uh, it is a act that asks for the United States to help Taiwan push back diplomatically against China's uh, coercion, uh, stealing or cutting off Taiwan's diplomatic allies around the world. Uh, the Taiwan Defense Act, along with the Taiwan Inv Invasion Prevention Act, those two acts, as I just mentioned, they were just introduced. But uh, the content and the main idea of these two acts uh, seem to be a little bit uh, provocative because especially for the Taiwan Invasion uh, Prevention Act, in which some red lines was drawn uh, by U.S. congressmen, proposing that if CCP direct uh, attack Taiwan or military or CCP occupation of territory effectively controlled by Taiwan, or in the event that any mortal threat to lives of Taiwanese soldiers or civilians, the U.S. should respond uh, militarily to protect Taiwan. So uh, for this kind of uh, discussion and legislation, uh, to the China's eyes, it seems to be that the U.S. is pro, uh, is supporting Taiwan independence, something like that. So this might be certain kind of misinterpretation. Uh, however, there are more and more calls, uh, especially under President Biden, that the United States should drop uh, its ambiguity uh, and change to strategic clarity on this cross-strait uh, relations issues. Uh, so, as we can see, uh, Richard Haas uh, has, uh, he published an article saying that it is the way uh, to avoid a conflict between China and the United States uh, if we can adopt strategic clarity. However, on the administration side, it is quite interesting, even for Pompeo, uh, before leaving the, uh, the office during uh, the campaign, he once said the State Department is not changing its Taiwan policy, uh, even amid the cost to depart from the long-standing strategic ambiguity in the Taiwan Strait. In May uh, this year, Kirk Campbell, we all know he played a very significant, important role in the Biden administration with regard to the Indo-Pacific policy. He once said there, uh, he once said there are some significant downsides to the kind of what is called strategic clarity, referring to any conflict between the US and China over Taiwan would not likely to be contained to a small geographic area. This is quite important because uh, Kurt Campbell actually highlighted uh, the possible spillover or ramification impact uh, if war occurs between Taiwan, uh, sorry, between the United States and China. However, for President Biden himself, uh, we all know that in late October, he once said, uh, yes, the United States, uh, will. Uh, we have a commitment to do that, uh, to come to Taiwan's defense if China attacked Taiwan. Uh, but right after his uh, remarks, White House says that 
uh, our support for Taiwan is rock solid and committed to peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, but the policy itself has never changed. What is more important and noteworthy is President Biden, while having the virtual conference with President Xi on November uh, 15th, uh, he laid out U.S. one-China policy and he uh, changed the order uh, for the mentioning about three communiques, TRA and six assurances. He highlighted the importance of TRA. So he prioritized uh, the TRA uh, in his statement saying that the one China policy is guided by the TRA, the three communiques and the six assurances. This is quite important and very indicative. Uh, it is true that uh, TRA is a domestic law for the United States and any administration uh, in the States uh, has to abide by it. But from the Chinese side, they are saying, okay, this is a serious uh, uh, deviation from the one China policy uh, upheld by uh, different U.S. administrations. So uh, after uh, this statement, um, the Chinese side continued to send out three messages about this meeting. Uh, one is they asked the United States to, to stick to the one China policy. Second, Xi Jinping also mentioned some red line uh, in his discussion with President Biden over Taiwan. And thirdly, uh, the mouthpiece of the CCP, uh, the official mouthpiece of the CCP, such as Renmin Rilbao or Huanqiu Shibao, continue to criticize the United States for supporting uh, Taiwan independence. Okay, and then after that, President Biden also made some other remarks. Uh, however, uh, the White House continued to say the U.S policy remain unchanged. I think overall, if we are going to make an assessment about this strategic ambiguity, um, I think it is quite important to highlight this is a suboptimal outcome, uh, which might be not satisfied, but acceptable to each party involved in this cross-strait relations. And what is more important is in the first place <clears throat> and until now, the United States and Taiwan are the supporters for the status quo and thus limiting the discussion of strategic ambiguity to security issues. And U.S. has remained in politically ambiguous position across the Taiwan Strait by acknowledging China's position that there is only one Chinese government while maintaining robust unofficial relations with Taiwan. China however, is mixing strategic ambiguity with political ambiguity and trying to redefine the status quo across the Taiwan Strait. In other words, China continues to stress uh, that Taiwan is only a renegade province uh, of China. So what are the implications for Taiwan and for East Asian politics? Uh, one thing deserves uh, uh, more of our attention after November 15, uh, when President Biden and the President Xi uh, had their virtual meeting, the Chinese um, POA Air Force continued to conduct uh, this kind of cruise, flight cruise across uh, the Taiwan uh, ADIZ. Okay, as we can see from here, this is a uh, this is a the total number. Uh, on November 28th, in that uh, single on that single day, the POA Air Force conducted 27 flights uh, getting into this area, okay, uh, the uh, south part of Taiwan's ADIZ. And in whole November, there were 159 flights conducted by the PLA Air Force in this area. Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense, beginning in September 2020, uh, releasing this kind of report uh, on a daily basis, 
And we can see uh, in the past uh, a bit more than one year, usually it is the October that is the busiest high season for PLA to conduct this kind of uh, military exercises because it is quite symbolic. Uh, both sides across the Taiwan state uh, have their respective national day in October. And also uh, in the past few months, we witnessed uh, more and more US allies, uh, US and its allies conduct military exercises uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So China says, okay, this is more a reaction to that. Uh, not only uh, trying to deter Taiwan from taking any position uh, for independence. And uh, following that, uh, Taiwan continued to say, we stick to uh, stability and no provocation. Uh, but quite interestingly, about a month ago in early November, uh, there was a survey um, conducted um, by a very famous professor in Taiwan. It's a private uh, think tank. Uh, it's about the Taiwanese public opinion uh, under the military crisis across the Taiwan Strait. So the very first question is, uh, for some reason, uh, do you agree that the war would occur sooner or later across the Taiwan Strait? Especially this attack would be uh, initiated by the Chinese side. Um, it is quite interesting. For the respondents who hold a disagreement about this statement is more than 60%. Okay, it's more than 60%. In other words, right now in Taiwan, there are still more than 60% saying that, no, no, there is not going to have a war um, across the Taiwan Strait. But comparing to uh, last year, um, as in this slide, uh, the upper right hand side, as you can see, comparing to the, a year earlier, um, there seems to be a little bit more people saying that, okay, a war, a war across the Taiwan Strait is going to happen uh, in the near future. Because last year, uh, who are holding disagreement about the statement uh, was a record high. It's more than 67%. Okay. Uh, but on the uh, left hand side, as you can see, the question is, are you confident in that uh, military uh, Taiwan's military force can effectively defend Taiwan? About 48% of the respondents said yes, but about 46% of the respondents says no. Okay, they don't have the confidence that uh, our military force can effectively defend Taiwan. One very, very interesting question is about if China attacks Taiwan, will US military come to Taiwan's defense? Okay, this is a very, very interesting uh, question. More than 65% uh, of the respondents says, yes, it is quite likely that US is going to help Taiwan. Only 28.5% respondents says, no, it's quite unlikely that U.S. is going to uh, def help defend Taiwan militarily. However, over time, there seems to be a trend uh, like um, the figure in the bottom showed. Uh, more and more people are saying, especially for uh, these two categories uh, on the left-hand side, more and more people believe that the U.S. would send its troops to help Taiwan. Okay, more and more people believe that. Okay, how about the role of Japan? Okay, will Japan's military come to Taiwan's defense? About 58% people say yes, they are going to help Taiwan. And also one last question is about, will there be local collaborators from within to help China if a war occurred? More than 50% respondent says yes. So this shows uh, there seems to be a national domestic cohesion issue uh, in, in Taiwan. Okay, so what is um, so important? I think for now, uh, the US Indo-Pacific strategy is still in line with Taiwan's current interest. 
Uh, so we really need uh, U.S. Um, assistance uh, politically uh, to deter uh, Chinese uh, ambition across the Taiwan Strait. But in the meantime, as I just mentioned, there seems to be one of the downsides if the U.S. choose to shift to strategic clarity. Uh, the ramification effect uh, would draw U.S. allies, not only U.S., but also U.S. allies in this area. Uh, to respond to uh, China's military attack, uh, attack across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but um, we, we see that uh, Japan right now has a new uh, prime minister. And also for U.S. ROK alliance, Moon Jae-in is going to um, step down next year, in May next year. And uh, Korea is going to have their uh, presidential election in March next year. So what is going to happen? And also uh, another uh, very important ally to the United States is the Philippines. The Philippines is going to have uh, their presidential election too in May next year. So what is going to happen um, while US allies are having their domestic uh, political needs? Um, I, and uh, whether this is a good time uh, a good timing for U.S. to uh, militarily uh, respond to uh, China. Uh, I think that remains a uh, big question. Uh, so in the future, we still need to pay attention to this China factor in domestic politics in East Asia. Okay, um, I, I think I'll stop here. Uh, sorry, I'm a, a bit over time. Um, and uh, all comments and questions are welcome. Thank you. All right, well, um, thank you, Professor Lu, for, for a very stimulating and um, comprehensive talk. We really covered all the bases. Um, I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions. Um, I was, you know, certainly I, I have some, but I thought I would start with pivoting to Shishan Dai, um, who is a postdoctoral researcher at UCLA and who helped organize this talk. Um, Shishan, do you, do, you, do you have any questions for Professor Lu? Uh, yes, and uh, thank you, Professor Liu, for your uh, great presentation. I learned a lot from, from your talk. And I'm just wondering that uh, it seems to be uh, the case that keeping the status quo uh, seems to be uh, have long been the norm among Taiwan, U.S., and China. And in your opinion, which party might take the initiative to change the status quo? And how would uh, the other parties react to uh, the change if such change occurred? Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Dai, uh, for, for this uh, very good question. I think for now, uh, it seems to me that uh, China uh, not only has the intention, but also has uh, the capabilities uh, to shake the boat um, for its domestic uh, concerns and also uh, to achieve uh, Xi Jinping's uh, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, uh, this China dream thing. Uh, one thing is also very, very interesting. Um, while I was uh, talking to some uh, Chinese scholars a uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, I, I raised a question to them. I said, there seems to be a growing nationalism on the Chinese side, uh, which could uh, in return constrain uh, the policy choices of the top leadership. Um, their responses are, were quite interesting. They said that, um, that yes, there seems to be uh, this kind of trend and uh, this growing national, nationalistic sentiment in the case of China is actually a, uh, a uh, mixed um, outcome for many, many issues. Uh, it's domestic economic situation, uh, it's overall foreign policy, something like that. But I think uh, we call uh, some very fervent uh, nationalists as little pinks nowadays. I think this little pinks uh, did play a constraining role uh, if Xi Jinping is trying to uh, engage with Taiwan uh, politically or to have this kind of conversation or dialogue across the Taiwan Strait. And I'm afraid uh, in, the, in, in the following few years, still China would use this kind of uh, nationalism to further justify its ruling in 
China, especially the CCP's ruling in China. But in the meantime, trying to change the status quo across Taiwan Strait. So I think China uh, is the one uh, who is going to change the status quo. Thanks. Um, yeah, look, I suppose I, I also wonder about the US as well. Um, domestic, the, obviously, the, the US political system is um, experiencing its own kind of crisis um, right now. Um, so, how do you see the potential return of President Trump changing the, the situation in across the strait? Um, obviously, bipartisan policy in the US has evolved to be harder on China. But you mentioned in during your talk that, the, that President Trump is also you know, highly transactional. So he's almost a bit more unpredictable. So how, how do you see um, the, the next US presidential election shaping events across the street? Yes, uh, I think it is quite important uh, for the United States to continue uh, this very pragmatic um, way dealing with the cross-strait relations uh, issues uh, under President Biden. Uh, so if um, Trump uh, gets back to become the president again, um, I think um, for the Chinese side, uh, they might have been prepared uh, for that to a certain degree. So uh, on the Chinese side, I think they would try to satisfy uh, President Trump um, to a certain degree, especially on economic terms. However, um, I would say there seems to be a structural uh, constraint to U.S.-China relations. So China as a rising power would continue to challenge the United States no matter who is in charge. So I think this is a, a big problem. So uh, even for uh, Trump to become the president again, uh, I think the United States still have to keep an, a sober eye on the development of China, especially uh, Xi Jinping's intention uh, for this region. Yes. Um, so uh, I want to pivot to the audience. Um, if please uh, post your questions in the chat. Um, if you have any questions for for Professor Liu, um, yes. Yeah, so Xi Jinping is the is the um, you know is the X factor in many ways. Everyone's left guessing about his 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 long term intentions. Oh, I see. There is um, there are some questions in the Q and A. I must have missed them. Uh, uh, oh, here we go. Sorry, I did not use this platform before. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, Wang Chunhan asked an important question. Um, you, know, you know, you talked a little bit about Japan, but obviously any conflict in the strait would implicate the whole region. And we certainly see Australia, um, you know, trying to you know, uh, form the new AUKUS alliance and the, the quad being elevated, et cetera. And do you see the, the, the potential for the, the region to, um, to, for a kind of counter China alliance to solidify in response to increasing belligerent actions across the strait? Or where do you think, how do you think the, the broader region is, is, is going to feature in, in the, the uh -huh. conflict? Yes. Okay. Very good question. Uh, I think in the years to come uh, for this region, uh, I think if we are going to uh, have stability and peace in this region, China needs to somehow uh, change its behavior, especially uh, to many others. Uh, China's war warrior diplomacy is very counterproductive. Okay, it's very counterproductive. Uh, for other countries, I think we should have more dialogue and more mechanism uh, to exchange our views, uh, to change, uh, to exchange our notes uh, about our understanding of, about China. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I don't think a full uh, version of containment is going against China is going to work uh, because so many countries in this region 
still have uh, very strong economic ties with China, even though everybody is trying to um, divert their investment in China because the overall environment is changing right now. But take Taiwan, for example, in the past two years, we still, um, all our export, um, more than 40% still goes to China. Okay, so this is a very, um, this is the, uh, the realistic part uh, of the world. So I think for the years to come, uh, we should uh, oppose China's assertive behavior, China's aggressive actions, but not necessarily uh, to form an anti-China camp. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have we have time for another question. Um, so from Catherine Tai, she she asks. Um, you know, the, the, your, your slides in public opinion in Taiwan are very interesting. Uh, and it seems to be that despite all the, the headlines about um, increasing tensions, that people are very sanguine in Taiwan today about the threat posed by China. Well, why do you think, what do you think is going on? Yes, um, I think uh, the polls uh, in Taiwan is quite interesting uh, in uh, two ways. Uh, my takeaway is uh, one is uh, for most people living in Taiwan, uh, we don't see that war is going to happen uh, tomorrow. Uh, still, we are quite confident that um, it is not going to happen. The second thing is we have a very high uh, degree of confidence in U.S. role uh, if any war occurs across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, I wouldn't see. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, these two views are very, very pragmatic. But I did talk to some of my students and also to uh, my neighbors to talk about what is going to happen. Uh, do you think uh, if China invades Taiwan? Uh, some of them gave me uh, some very politically uh, correct answer. They said that uh, I will fight uh, uh, until uh, I die, something like that. But uh, Many people responded that um, they are going to wait and see to see what is going to happen. Uh, so I'm not sure how much this is relating to uh, um, Taiwan people's uh, pragmatic view about the world. But I think um, even for people living in Taiwan, uh, we continue to say we need to deal with uncertainties. So. I believe most people in Taiwan right now are not going to make up their mind and speak it loudly uh, to the world what is going to happen if a war really occurs. So that's not good for uh, social scientists because we wouldn't <laughs> uh, be able to learn um, from uh, the outcome. Yeah, but I think this is what people really think in Taiwan. All right, yeah, thank you. Um... Look, this was a fascinating presentation and we, we are out of time, so um, I, will, I will wrap up now. But um, I just want to say thank you to Professor Liu for, for your excellent presentation and for um, presenting to the audience. So I just want to note that um, this talk was sponsored by the Asia Pacific Center at UCLA um, and the Taiwan in the World program has been supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Taiwan and TECO Los Angeles. And this is part of the Center's broader Taiwan Studies program. Um, so I want to say thank you to um, the Executive Director, Elizabeth Lester, Assistant Director, Aaron Miller, um, to Dai Su Chan for organizing this, and to, of course, to Professor Liu for, um, for his talk. So thanks so much, everyone, and um, hopefully, hopefully all uh, work out well in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to again express my gratitude to, to all the organizers and uh, 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 also uh, to the audiences uh, for your contribution. Uh, I really, uh, I'm really glad that I can have this opportunity to share my personal views with you. And I hope to uh, to meet all of you maybe in person uh, or uh, by virtual means uh, in the near future. Thank you very much.